welcome. Welcome. Oh, yes, they're wonderful. Yes, I, uh, we just got a notification that the session is being recorded. Um, it's uh, an absolute pleasure to welcome Sarah for this afternoon of a conversation with the, with the author of the uh, colleagues who have a recent book published and have made time to share their thoughts on it, the journey until the book has been published. And uh, Sarah is known to all friends and followers of Zoroastrian studies at SOAS. She is the Shapurji Palanji Senior Lecturer in Zoroastrianism and the co-chair of the SOAS Shapurji Palanji Institute of Zoroastrian Studies in um, uh, collaboration with Professor Almut Hintze. Sarah studied the subject at SOAS and one of the very few immensely blessed individual who studied with Professor Mary Boyce. And many of you will know that Professor Boyce very generously left her uh, huge legacy to SOAS to ensure the continuation of the subject. And Sarah uh, has worked on many aspects of the uh, subject and um, uh, her focus has been Zoroastrian living traditions. She has worked in the field with Professor Philip Cranbrook, that if I'm not mistaken, or amongst the audience, and with Mrs. Shahnaz Munshi on oral study project in India in the 1990s, and from which she developed her recent project, which is focused on Iran. She has had a British Academy grant that supported her research. The book that we're talking about today is the second of two volumes, and it covers uh, the cities of Tehran, Kerman, Esfahan, Shiraz, and Ahvaz. And, um, uh, this volume is really focused on Yazd and the remaining Zoroastrians in the villages in Yazd. So, Sarah, a very warm welcome to this uh, mid-afternoon conversation. And I want to know, before we get into the uh, depths of the book, how did you come to start this project? Begin the journey for me, please. Oh, well, thank you, Nargis. Thank you for your introduction and thank you to Katie and to Natalie for organising this event and to this amazing, wonderful audience. And it's wonderful to see friends, colleagues, students, former students, current students. So you're right, Nargis, I think of this um, as a completion of a journey, a long journey. Mm -hmm. And indeed, it began in India some 15 years ago. And the point, I'll just make a point about that project, which was that it involved recruiting someone from the Parsi community, an insider, if you like, to carry out the majority of the work over two or three years. So Mrs. Munshi did the most of the interviews and we trained her in using, using the equipment and so on. And after her, her sad uh, passing away, I thought, I would love to take a similar type of project to Iran because we'd always thought we would do that together. And so some years later, uh, my collaborator for the Iran project was uh, a former student of SOAS, Mandana Mahavanat. And so she and I went to Iran to see how feasible it might be. And thanks to the support from her family and friends, we got all the relevant permissions that we needed and we met all the Zoroastrian Anjumans there, there are 16 Anjumans, mm -hmm. to talk to them and present the project and get permission for you know to approach individuals. So the purpose really was to map the remaining uh, Zoroastrian community in Iran and to look at the changes that had happened in people's religious lives since the 60s and 70s when Mary Boyce did an in-depth ethnographic, ethnographic study of the village of Sharifabad. And in the 70s, uh, the uh, um, anthropologist Michael Fisher focused on Narsiabad, another uh, Yazdi village. But to date, although there have been recent studies 
that have focused largely on Tehran and various subjects, there hasn't been this kind of mapping or survey of the Zoroastrian community throughout Iran. So there was that aspect. And then, of course, to look at further changes that have happened since 1979. And most importantly, to track and trace and record the Dari language for future research. Well, amazing. Dari, I mean, um, the Dari language, I mean, um, tell me more about this. This is not what the Dari that we normally assume. So I think, think about Afghanistan. Think Afghanistan. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. the, the Dari language in uh, certainly in, in this part of, of uh, Iran is associated traditionally with the Zoroastrians of Yazd and Kerman. Mm -hmm. And it's not the Afghan Dari, and it's not mm. the um, the court language, also called Dari, the, of the Parthian times. So um, this is now in Ke what we think of as Kermani Dari is rarely spoken anymore. The villages around Kerman, the Zoroastrian villages, are no longer uh, Zoroastrian. And in Yazd, the Dari is still spoken in different dialects throughout the remaining villages. But it is a dying language. And our recordings have all been deposited in ELA, the Endangered Languages mm -hmm. Archive at SOAS, which is a wonderful repository, which means that they will be there for safekeeping in perpetuity. Fantastic, fantastic. And we'll have to have an, a session on that as well. And um, now I have a probably sounds like a very ignorant question, Sarah, so forgive me. But thinking about this vast empire and you know Zoroastrian communities, why Yaz? Why is it that Yaz contains the large you know settlement of Zoroastrians of Iran? Well, um, I mean this is a sort of thousand year plus history, so I'll just I can whistle through a few important moments in that history. We know that Yazd was a, a center for Zoroastrians in Sasanian period. There was a big fire temple there. That fire temple was replaced with a mosque after the um, Arab invasion in the in the seventh century. And indeed, the Jame Mosque today is built on the same mm -hmm. on the same site. So, at some point in the twelfth century, the Dast or Dast Turan, the, the high priest moved from Pars to Yaz province and he took with him the two surviving great Faharam fires, the highest great mm -hmm. fires in Zoroastrianism. And they were hidden away in the village of Sharifabad in very unobtrusive, simple mud brick uh, chambers. And then a bit later, sometime in the 18th century, the Dastur moved into Yazd itself in the Mahale Dastaran where Zoroastrians still live today. We know that there was correspondence with Parsi priests in India who were seeking advice from the, um, from the uh, Iranian priests. And those letters called the Persian Rivayats date from the, go from the 14th to the 17th century. And apart from that, uh, of course there's lots and lots, but I can't go into that now. Yes, yeah. um, but, I think the next perhaps turning point during the Qajar period, there was an all time low, probably less than 10,000 souls in Iran, Zoroastrians. And so uh, there was a bit of a turnaround in the middle of the 19th century in the form of one Manekchi Limji Hataria, who's a Parsi emissary sent from Iran to see what was going on and, and, and what was with the plight of his co religionists. And he arrived in 1854 and he stayed there a decade. Wow. And one of his great achievements was to get Nasruddin Shah to temporarily revoke the dreaded jizya or poll tax, and which gave some respite to Zardoshtis. And money then started to flow from Parsi businessmen and fire temples and dachmas were restored. So there began a sort of slight you know, progression in the fortunes of Zoroastrians in Iran. And then in 1905, um, the Constitutional Revolution, a representative was elected to the first Iranian parliament, which gave them a voice for the first time. And yeah, so as trading restrictions eased, Zardoshtis were able to trade with India. And Mary Boyce in her notebooks describes the, the great um, camel trains that went from Yazd 
via the port of Bandarabas to India. And she talks about um, these huge long trains. Every sixth camel had a big deep bell to let the drover know that uh, all was well in the train. And uh, as they approached, the, it was a three, a three month journey. They went at night um, during the summer and in the winter by day. And as they approached Yaz, the village of uh, Ramatabad, all the camels were decked out with um, bells and flowers and plumes on their heads uh, to mark the grand entry into, into town. And the exports to India were a variety of um, the, the madder purple dye, the silk shawls, the give shoes with the cotton upper, and of course, pistachios, almonds, opium, um, dried plums. Mm -hmm. And from India, they got saffron and cinnamon and uh, um, uh, tea and sugar and all sorts of other spices as well. Amazing. I think that's a lot more tantalizing than silk roots. I much prefer the uh, fire going across and these beautifully clad um, camels. So obviously, you know, thousands uh, of years of history. But Sarah, um, through your research and your studies, what are the main changes that have taken place? You mentioned that Professor Boyce's studies of these communities. So what are the changes since the 60s and 70s that you refer to in, in terms of the communities or Astrian communities there? Well, I think one of the, the major changes which has had multiple sort of knock-on effect is the, um, the gradual um, depletion of the water supply. And this is something that came up in our interviews over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, this has caused a, a shift from rural to urban living. So people are leaving the villages, going to the towns. And, um, but it isn't a recent problem. So I think one major factor was during the 50s when they began to sink these deep uh, wells and uh, these pump wells. And that um, diminished the vast network of canots, which had mm -hmm. irrigated the whole of the Yazd region since pre-Islamic times. And so it meant that the water flow to the Khanats was diminished, and some of them dried up altogether. And so farming became gradually unsustainable for as it is today. Mm -hmm. But during Boyce's time there, there was still an extraordinary variety of crops and market gardening that went on. And traditionally, um, Zoroastrians were renowned in Iran for being excellent gardeners. And of course, it goes back to you know, the religion to, to nurture the plants and the, all the various creations. So uh, she, in her notebook again, she does, she talks about uh, proliferation of co crops. This is in Hassanabad, which were watered by the sweet rather than the brackish water. Mm -hmm. So just an example, I mean, the edges of the fields were sown with pistachio and cotton, carrots and turnips for the, for the animals. But then the trees, you know, mulberries, willows, poplars, elm, ash, and in the courtyards, apples, pears, plums, mulberry, pomegranates. So extraordinary proliferation for a desert region. And uh, so one of the things perhaps I should have mentioned was why the Zoroastrians relocated there back mm. way back when. And it's because that region is so dry. It's on the on the edge of the Dasht de Kavir, it's great salt desert it was very isolated and the climate's very harsh and so today quoting from um, um, an interview when you go to Husseinabad you would have seen three cows that is where the Zoroastrians used to live if you had asked they would have shown you the houses but they're all boarded up now because the water dried up everyone has left it must be said they visit but when they come um, there's no way of getting water to the region, they became disheartened and mm -hmm. they still think about the area. So I'm just going to um, just share my screen. Yeah. Uh, I hope it will work because I thought I'd just give you a very, um, just a quick picture. Uh, yeah, it'd be lovely, few, some images, that would be absolutely fantastic. Few slides. Yes, yeah. Uh, just to show you, can you see? Perfect, I can, certainly can, yeah. Good. Yeah. So this is um, this is just a typical um, uh, village, mm -hmm. Zoroastrian village. 
It's the village of Zainabad. There are no Zardashtis living there any longer, no permanent residents, though many still return to their um, to their homes, which they keep up for um, festivities or in uh, commemoration of deceased members of the family. So going clockwise, these are the typical mud brick houses open uh, at, in the roof, at the backdrop of these extraordinary hills, very, very stark and barren, but to my mind, very beautiful. Then here are some typical fields, tiny patch of green where there's water to, to uh, irrigate the crops. The Arban Bar down below, the water tank where you go down the steep steps to the water at the bottom and the Badgir or the wind towers on either side, which keep it cool. And then this is an open water channel going from a tank to the fields in Zainabad. Mm -hmm. This is a tiny a fire temple there, very, very simple and very typical of an old um, village fire temple. So on the left, you have the, the main room that you go into. The black door at the back goes into the the sort of ante room to the fire chamber so you would light a candle there and say prayers but um, even Zoroastrians don't go into the fire chamber itself that's only for the uh, the the Atashban the person who the priest who looks after the fire and then the tiny kitchen which is attached to all the fire temples wood fire and pots and ladles for the jashans and the celebrations this is a typical Zarosti house, village house, open to the skies, of course, vulnerable to theft. In the bad days, people would come in and steal and vandalize properties. And a lovely gentleman there, who was one of our very first interviewees, who passed away some years ago. And then again, adjoining the fire temple, little rest area um, with the beds you can see in it. And then this is typical Zardoshti village shrines. So again, clockwise, this is a little, could say a little lane in Nursiabad. These village lanes are, well, certainly when I was there, absolutely immaculately clean. Uh, this is the Pire Sarush in Zainabad, little, little shrine without its um, light in it. On the right hand side here, is the shrine adjoining or just outside next to the fire temple in Cham. And this was once a magnificent cypress, which is now not doing too well. And down below is this typical um, shrine from a, from a home, a domestic shrine with the uh, deceased members of the family in photos at the back. This is the Piri Murt in Hosseinabad, uh, the Myrtle Shrine. And then this is the a shrine again in Hosseinabad um, to Khwaja Khesra, who's a sort of a, I think you would describe him as a saint, a gentleman man in white who appears and helps people. And this is a typical um, village reclaimed by the, by, the, um, by the sand, by the desert. So Jafarabad is empty now and you can see what happens. It's just engulfed with the sand. Uh, this is a, a former school in Sharifabad, a Jamshidi school, again abandoned and down below uh, a house that uh, is, this is sort of as they gradually break down into the, into the dust. And I'll just finish here with um, the typical um, Iranian women's costume, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, you don't see it too much today. Uh, but still sometimes in the villages and in Yazd. And this set of the Shalva Kamiz and the, and the Mac Moon was lent to our Everlasting Flame exhibition by um, Mrs. Firoza Pantaki Mystery. And I just want to show you these pieces of fabric because when you think of the Zardoshti costume, you think it being very brightly colored and decorative, but actually it has a history. So. All these fine strips here of cloth, which are sewed together, Zoroastrians weren't allowed to buy cloth by the yard and they weren't allowed into the fabric shops. So whatever was deposited, the odds and ends were just put outside in a bin and they could collect them from there. And they stitched them all together and uh, embroidered them and made uh, these beautiful 
um, you know, these costumes that you can see today. So that's all I have to say uh, by way of mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the slides. So mm -hmm. we're out of the slideshow, right? Yes, we are. Yeah, I can see you now. Yes, we're yeah, back. yes. Um, it, it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's devastating, really, the nature, you just, it, it, the sand and the brutality of that landscape, it's, you know, very hard to fight that. And um, uh, bringing it a little bit more up to date, and in the 70s and onwards, from 79 onwards, any um, changes there? Well, of course, there have been changes. I am um, there, perhaps quite subtle and I think of them I've sort of categorized them as those that um, it's, it's a process really of, of re-identifying I suppose uh, reforming of identities and there are those that Zoroastrians share with their fellow Iranians and these might be the sorts of symbols that we which have now become mainstream in Iran so the Fravohar symbol people wear the gold Fravohar quite often around their neck whether they're Zoroastrian or not obviously goes back to pre-Islamic times and the Saris, uh, the Saris's tomb as well. Um, then there are shared experiences like the Iran-Iraq war. Certainly from my in interviews, um, it seems that allegiance to Iran came before religious considerations. I mean, it's quite a complex issue and question, but nevertheless, it's a shared part of Iranian identity that outsiders don't share. And then of course, there's everything to do with being Zoroastrian, which is particular to that identity. So I've talked about the dress, the language, the religion, the, sh the peers that, and the shrines that, that people go to, um, but also this, this shift from uh, out of rural areas to the cities and from the cities abroad brings on the pressures and the concerns to do with emigration, marriage out of the community and conversion. And these are things that came up in our interviews quite a lot. And so, uh, and caused um, by, the, you know, the lack of jobs and, and that um, kind of thing, no longer a farming community really. And so I'll, if I've got time, I can just, read two little snippets on those yes, please. Yeah. is there time so yeah so one gentleman summed up both points of view so of course the, there are many for emigration and and others against and the same with intermarriage so uh, he said uh, emigration has to be examined from two perspectives one is to do with responsibility and the other to do with practicality from the responsibility perspective we are the inheritors of an ancient culture and the way we're going, unfortunately, I do not think that after one or two generations, we'll have more than a few people left belonging to our religion and our base will disappear from this world. From this point of view, we have a responsibility towards our ancestors and our descendants, and we should therefore not emigrate. But we look, if we look at it from the point of view of living conditions and bearing in mind the social conditions presently prevailing in our country, and remembering the limitations Zoroastrians and other minority groups face, these exist and no one can deny them. A minority person will not be employed in the armed forces. This is a limitation and there are, no, and there are other limitations. So for those that have no future here, especially financially, um, that it's a crime against their children if they stay. So it depends on which perspective you, mm. you adopt. For that, yeah, I was going to, I, I'm keeping an eye on the questions uh, streaming in as well. I was going to ask you to, you know, do a comparison with the parties of India, but I know that there are a couple of questions who've asked that. But before uh, we move on to question and answer, Sarah, what is, what is your next uh, project? How are you taking this forward? Well, I um, <laughs> projects abound, uh, yeah. but um, in terms of this, and, and this is just a wonderful opportunity, but I can't really give a sense of, of what, of the voices that we have in these books. And so it's just a thought, and I've discussed it with Mandana, 
in yeah. uh, Toronto. And what I would like to do is perhaps have a series of readings, short webinars, mm. perhaps choose some topics yeah. on marriage, on rituals, on changes, all sorts of things. And to just literally do some readings oh, in English yeah. and Mandana in um, in Persian. So if there'd be if people would be interested in that, then that would be that would be something I'd love to do. Yeah, fantastic. Well, uh, one of our participants has taken the words out of my mouth when I was going to ask about the comparison with Parsons of India, and they wonder vis-a-vis -vis, um, visiting fire temples. What what are the rules around that? Do you know if there's any variations between how Iranians or Austrians? you know, allow access compared to visiting a um, temple in India? So temples in India, uh, uh, no outsider can go into, no non, non Zoroastrian. Yes. And in Iran, in the major fire temples, you can um, visit. You can actually go and see the, the fire burning in in the fire temple in Yazd, for example. At the same time, um, the fire temples, it's, it's, Zoroastrians are really obliged to put them on the tourist map. Mm. And so they don't have much choice but to have them open. But um, of course, it doesn't mean that all fires everywhere, you know, where they're much more private, that people um, uh, go in. I mean, they don't. So. For that, there are a couple of comments here who say they're incredibly moved by how fondly you speak of Shahnaz, um, yeah. and there. So that's very much appreciated. Um, one uh, a question was that about the. Let me see. I've just. Um, um, the, it says. Um, uh, uh, did you have a chance to follow up with the families in Sharifabad who were, you know, who were studies by Professor Boyce? I mean, were there descendants that might have, you know, remembered her or tell you, who, you know, they were still continuing to live in Sharifabad? Funnily enough, there was um, a heated debate when we were in Sharifabad. Uh, it went on, and it was during um, a, a, a big a Gahamba lunch going on in the village hall. And there were those that were um, quite critical of Boyce um, in so far as they felt that she'd portrayed Zoroastrianism as, as, as something of a, a very conservative backwater hey. and a rural um, community where very strict purity laws were still kept. And of course, with her eye on uh, interest in the religion, and the texts that uh, you, people would have followed in the way that they lived the religion, that was her focus. So to find somewhere she, where she found such things being, um, you know, preserved was a great interest to her. And some were not very, you know, felt that they, that they, that they hadn't been portrayed as a sort of, you know, correctly, if you like. Uh, but there were others who said that she was absolutely remarkable in how accurately she recorded and observed everything. And I, uh, in the Ancient India and Iran Trust, um, the uh, I can I think uh, Sula Sims Williams is here. Um, the the uh, all voices photographs and notebooks are kept. And I've had access to the notebooks and they're absolutely extraordinary. Amazing. Over 50 notebooks, wow. um, detailed, beautiful handwriting, mm -hmm. recording without her own sort of theoretical input, if you like, just the detail Amazing. of everything that's grown and everything that's done. And um, so, uh, yeah, so that's, did that answer your question? That's right, yes, it did, oh, no. absolutely. Right. And you said that there were right. some. And uh, one question, um, intrigued by the Khiz writing you mentioned, uh, uh, saints dressed in white. Could you elaborate on that? Okay, please? yeah, so Khaja <laughs> Khiz is that, it's interesting because there are, there are legends and stories um, that you think when you're in a village and you hear this, you think, oh, that's um, that's interesting, and you identify it with that village. And then you go to another village, 
but could even go from Kerman to Yaz, and you hear the same story, and you know that this is very much, with, but with perhaps different characters involved or a different detail, and this is very much what happens in mm -hmm. an oral tradition. Yeah. You have, you know, tales and themes and yeah. legends, and they migrate. And uh, so this is a both a, a peer, a shrine, and a person, and so the stories would entail somebody um wanting uh, making a wish or uh, a vow and and or, or in trouble and um for example there's one story a, a woman told about um a little oil lamp that was kept in the shrine in the village and it kept being stolen and um apparently uh, somebody was doing that a non was was going in and taking it and then this person was confronted one day or one night with this man in white and was absolutely terrified and never did it again yeah. so that's the kind of thing that Father has yeah. is reported that? yeah absolutely yes and of course there's so much of that presence in Persian literature that there is a Khazri is brilliant sort of leading one to the fountain of life. Um, one question which, um, about uh, education. Well, I know that, you know, when I was all those, uh, you know, millennia ago being going to school in Tehran, that um, the role that uh, Zoroastrian communities or uh, patrons have had in establishing schools and, you know, they were quite crucial in, uh, making education available. Some of the best high schools were endowed by Zoroastrian communities, not necessarily even Zoroastrians of Iran, some from India. So the question now is about access to education for modern day Zoroastrians and whether you encountered them. How, what was your impression of the level or, or their access to um, oh. Yes, yeah. access to school, uh, to school, I mean, absolutely, uh, 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 along with everybody. So very well educated, um, ambitious, and both um, very much uh, evenly balanced. So men and women aspire to um, careers and professional jobs mm -hmm. following education. Um, there is a, an entrance exam to university which entails a religious component. And because they don't always have, um, they don't have Zoroastrians marking the Zoroastrian, if, if you wrote your essay on a Zoroastrian subject. So quite often the Zardoshis do the Islamic part of that exam to make sure that they're, you know, given an even chance to get in. But once they're in university, then, you know, the, they, it, 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 my impression has, was that there was an equal opportunity to education, but jobs, no, I mean, there, there are, I don't know to the, the extent to which there's discrimination in the workplace, to be perfectly honest, because Zoroastrians there seem to have, you know, uh, have good jobs. Mm -hmm. But jobs generally are um, as, as something that many seek mm. to go abroad to mm. uh, to get better jobs, to earn more, to have more security. Yeah. Yes. For that, there are two um, questions that probably span, you know, over a hundred years. One is about that you, you, the reference you made to um, the Rajar. Um, uh, uh, lifting or being persuaded to lift the jazia. There's just whether you could just say any uh, a little more about the life of Zoroastrians during the Rajar time, and then followed by much more recent observations. Are you aware of the Zoroastrian community right now being particularly impacted by the COVID pandemic? Um, which is probably the next project for you, but maybe a, just a little more depiction of Zoroastrians in the Qajar time. Thank well, you. during the Qajar time, all we know is that, that, it, that it was an all time low uh, in that there was a, a very tiny population. They paid a lot of taxes. The, um, the, it's been very well documented, the kind of um, 
marginalization, discrimination, indignities that they suffered during that period. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, Zoroastrians, uh, their houses had always to be, they couldn't build a house higher than their neighboring or than a Muslim house. They weren't allowed the wind towers at all. So you can imagine in, in Yazd, in the searing heat of the summer, how how awful that must have been. They um, they weren't allowed to ride horses, they had to ride donkeys, they had to have a distinctive, they couldn't, um, they had these, this very um, yellow dyed uh, clothing that the men wore. Um, so everything that um, distinguished them, which of course made them very easy to pick out, you know, when they were trying to get from A to B. Um, and girls were often um, abducted and forced into a marriage. So all of this uh, during the Qajar period, together with um, uh, just the population um, diminishing at, at, at such a rate. So that, yeah. that's that. I understand that COVID has hit the Zaroshi community badly. I don't have figures or numbers for that. Um, and uh, in so far, I mean, I, I suppose I know people who've lost a relative, but as a kind of general survey, I imagine that the figures are out there, but I, I don't know as yet. Yeah, there are a couple of questions about marrying. You you refer to um, uh, marrying yet in in your uh, talk, um, and I think this is coming from the perspective of a Muslim rather than I think seeing it from the other side. The question is: Are Muslim men allowed to marry Zoroastrian women? But I think I probably need to turn that over. That are Zoroastrians? Could you say a little more about? <laughs> marrying out how widespread is it how forgive well you of course yes um, <laughs> the inheritance laws mean yeah. that the muslim family will inherit mm. so of course it's not um uh desirable or condoned you know it, but of course it does it does happen it happens a lot but this is in the iranian context mm. and so by and large in interviews nobody was um, in favour of it. And I mean, I might just take the opportunity of yes. reading this tiny little snippet. Yeah. It's rather nice. So this is a woman who speaks quite forcefully. So she says, even if the non-Zardoshti bride or groom wished to join our community and convert, it would still be an awkward situation. In fact, that wouldn't be allowed, but anyway. Since the cultures between people from two different religious traditions will not match in any way, my father would say that marrying a Muslim wife would be like wearing white trousers with a black patch on them to cover up a rip. It stands out. I've not yet witnessed a successful marriage between people of two different religious traditions. Mm -hmm. So that was her opinion. That's very, I love that patching the white thing. Uh, the other thing is about, um, so somebody said that you know, when, um, in their experience, that Yaz is one of the most visited uh, cities, towns on the tourist trail, and obviously with all the, um, you know, from the uh, Cypress Tree, the South, to the Fire Temple, to so much other, the Water Museum. But it's, um, uh, is there a glass separation for a non-Muslim, for a non-Zoroastrian? How close can they get to the Holy well, Fire? it's a long time since, I mean, it's years since I was in Yazd. And yes, there is glass, absolutely. Glass behind, so it's behind uh, glass and then there are iron um, railings. I'm sure people, there are people who, in the audience here who, who would be able to mm -hmm. answer that. But absolutely, I mean, there's always, a, there's a glass barrier in as far as I'm aware. Yeah, yeah, for that thing. Uh, so interesting question. I think I probably partly know the answer because I do follow your research, but someone says that, um, immigration that you said that uh, one person is you know the direction of immigration out of iran which is you know one question wondering where uh is the most favored destination but what about um have iranian zartushis emigrated migrated to india obviously in present time and um do is there a comparative um look at analysis of the rituals their lives 
uh, if they have gone to India, how do they find it um, compared to the life they may have left behind in uh, Yaz, for example? And the, but the other question was, you know, the destinations uh, of okay, uh, so Zaratushtis who migrate. So they go. There's a large community in the in the US, mm -hmm. uh, the largest uh, next to India right. of Zoroastrians, both Parsi actually and Iranian, and then here as well. Iranian Zoroastrians have come here. Um, yes, they do go to India, and they have always gone to India, yeah. and had uh, all sorts of businesses there, particularly restaurants, and um, then through marriage as well, mm -hmm. they still go there. And so when you say, how do they find it? Well, they're not... the ones who go to India. So the particular thing was to go from one established Zoroastrian community yes. to another. Yes. Are there any studies of how do they compare and contrast? Well, um, they, they're always given a warm welcome in India. Um, there's a Iran um, league, like an Anjuman established in India. I mean, it's historic. So they've been going for, for, for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of religious practice, um, in India, the priestly rituals have been kept intact to a far greater extent than in, um, in Iran. So the, the major central uh, priestly act of worship, the Yasana ceremony is still performed in India, but significantly there's still a hereditary priesthood in India and there's still, there are two madrasas for training priests in India, and certainly one of them is operational. Mm. So that has all gone in Iran, uh, but there are still parts of the Yasna celebrated. Mm -hmm. There are still some hereditary priests in Iran, and uh, but the rituals, the priestly rituals, of course, for, for lots of reasons, are far less... Um, you know they're not up they're not of the same level or length that they are in India mm. but then I'm what's interested me was some very um it struck me in Iran that the Zoroastrians there um are are very um connected to Persian Persian literature particularly poetry so they know all the great poets they learn the po poetry from an early age and it's dropped into conversation, dropped into interview. Um, it's referred to a lot in telling a story. And that is different from our uh, the study we did in India and my experience. And they're also very, very particular about learning of Eston and Pahlavi when they do, learning to recite it correctly. And so in Iran, there's this annual uh, mantra competition for the young people, the young people um, have organized it, it's performed every year, it's a huge event. And this is all about learning about the religion, but particularly learning of Eston, and they have exams and things mm. like that. I don't think there's anything like that on that scale in India. Mm. Uh, that's crazy. But I have a little memory of going to Calcutta and, you know, finding, um, there's, I, I say the Zoroastrian uh, temple that might be more than one, which I remember was, you know, the other side of the street from an Arachan, um renovated house and I go and I think I just got there at the wrong time during a siesta, I think, knocking on this door and somebody opened the door, not too pleased. And of course, you know, I was, I was being nosy and they thought, oh God, in another Iranian turned up here. And um, but I suddenly said, I was just trying to, you know, endear myself to them. And I, it was amazing. So I said, you know, what are these things? There were all these gifts. There were posters. There were letters. There were lots of stuff sent from Iran. And of course, they were in Farsi. And of course, the man who said, you couldn't read. He said, well, there they are, these posters. And I was saying, but this is, you know, an, almost a love letter to you from Iran. to this. And so that began to slightly melt them and I think I, my husband and I got a cup of tea eventually but I was <laughs> astonished that this stuff that he said you know yes they do get this material oh. then like presents just a poster I mean there were posters of a film for example that they thought you might like this because there was a reference to the fire so um 
and but another, was, this a, was this a fire temple in Calcutta? Yes, it was. And of course, I said, you know, could I say, I've got absolutely not a chance <laughs> that it, no, you know, you could not going to get anywhere near it. Uh, I really, and they were getting prepared for a jashn. Um, and I'm always intrigued that um, uh, we've obviously just had the jashn in Sade a few days ago. Did most of do they differ? Is Nurus, for example, or Yalda, or you know these? I know the calendar is treated very differently. I know that the names of the months and the days are very different. Something that I think non-Zoroastrians in Iran have lost touch with the, the, the significance of the names of the months, etc. But bringing that down a level, are the rituals when when you were interviewing these people, were they did you ask them about in um, the way Noruz is celebrated or other things in these communities like in Yaz? And how do they compare in your experience in um, in India? Oh, well, Noruz is huge of, yeah. um, and, and always has been and traditionally pre-Islamic, of course. Yes. Christians. Um, but uh, and... Nowruz or is is of course celebrated in India as well, but there are three different calendars in India, yeah. and the combination of the calendars in India and the historic calendars in Iran are a total nightmare to work mm, out. Yes, and um, Mary Boyce and latterly actually Jenny Rose is somebody a scholar in in um, in the in the US have tackled the calendar issue. But yes, the festivals are all are all kept. Thank you. Both, yeah. both in the Parsi tradition and in the Iranian one. I mean, in Iran, there are some slightly different sofres, you know, and, and things that people do in their mm. own homes. Mm. But otherwise, the, the seasonal festivals are the same. For that, him, Jacob. Uh, someone is wondering that whether when you were in Yazd, did you visit the um, uh, Chak Chak uh, uh, mm. shrine with the thing? And anything about that in your book? Any yes, yes. references? Well, yes. Um, people talk about Piri Sabs and about going there. And the, yes. Uh, um, I mean, one interesting little anecdote um, was. Oh well, it's it's rather long. I can't I can't tell it. But um, yes. It's it's about a man who who was very friendly with a um, a commander in the a colonel in the army a Muslim colonel and he describes um, a visit to um, Chak Chak yeah. and he says that the um, the Muslim colonel's mother was a very religious woman who would who would cover up if a male fly flew into the room. <laughs> And so she went on this family picnic outing and spread her prayer mat and did her namaz. And so the my interviewee, who again, he's from Ahwaz and he's now passed away. Uh, he was describing what a good looking young man he was because we asked how he had got married and how he'd found his wife. So this was all a prelude to that. And then he did find a wife and everything. And he was asked much later if this colonel in the army could take his mother back to Chak Chak. And so this gentleman said, but well, yes, of course, but why? And she said, oh, when she was there, she had prayed that you would find a wife. And of course, very shortly afterwards he had. So that was quite a nice story. But yes, that's how it occurs through the book. I could have shown slides of Piri Saabs yeah. and the Great Fires and so on, but they are really out there. You can find them easily on the internet, so. Yes. Well, I know I had the privilege of seeing some of your photographs. I think we can almost have a talk where we just go travel with you through all the lovely pictures you've taken over um, your trips. Um, there is there are several questions that you can imagine have come up about, you know, such a small community living in Iran at the moment. That they said, but are you blatantly aware of... Um, discrimination when you were there questioning there is this is this something that is palpable that their ways of life are you know infringed upon and um they live under a you know a, rules that do not meet with their traditions um well of course the the the, the, the bottom line is that the 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 constitution 
revisions to the civil code, the penal code, there are discriminatory clauses that affect all religious minorities in Iran to this day. Yeah. The fact is the Zoroastrians have a very vocal um, member of parliament who speaks yeah. out, who tries to get things overturned. Um, all of that is on, I would say, on one level. And um, there's a historic, there's a history, as we know, it's well documented of, of real persecution and bloodshed going back to the the seventh century so I wouldn't for a minute overlook that the point is that wasn't the purpose of the yeah of the project and nor to be nor to uh I should say people didn't volunteer those kinds of anecdotes or stories I mean yeah. they wouldn't have talked about politics we didn't ask about politics but they were what struck me is that they were people going about their everyday lives as we all are with concerns about education, concerns about getting a good job, um, finding a, a husband or a wife, raising mm -hmm. a family. And no, I was not aware of discrimination as such. They had very good relations with their immediate neighbours. I'm sure they were battling away at, um, you know, sort of, what's the word, uh, regional government levels. Yes. Yeah. and there's all sorts of things, land issues and so on. But water, actually, uh, water, as you mentioned, just you know. Yes, um, water's still a very powerful economic asset yeah. um, mm. and managed the whole kind of yeah. as, it, as it remains. But yeah. yeah, so no, you wouldn't be, you'd never think that, uh, you know, I never witnessed any any episodes of discrimination. Yeah. Yeah, there are one, there's several, but I'm sorry that I can't see the names of people who posed the question, but it's a wonderful recollection from one of our participants who says, you know, I, I stayed with a Zoroastrian family in Yazd in 1969, and my host pointed out that none of the houses in that quarter had locks on their front door. Is this something that came up at all in your uh, conversations? No, I mean, sadly, I wouldn't think that happens today. Um, the locks, the, the doors were, were just wonderful. And the locks on the doors were very beautiful and significant um, designs. And many of most of those, I think, I can say would have been stolen by now. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, but the sense of that, obviously, theft or all this was not such a... It, you know, I don't know. It was I, I honestly don't know. Who knows? I yeah. think it's probably things change in that. I know it's interesting the locks and the knockers that are very yes. in Iran have that there is a male and you know whether you're a <laughs> male rapping on the door or a female. And um, uh, two questions. I'm conscious that we're coming up to 4 p.m. and maybe squeeze in two things. Any um, data on possible Zoroastrians move to East Africa and, for example, Zanzibar? Um, someone asking, is that something that popped up in your research that you're aware of? No, I mean, there's a community, there was a community in Zanzibar, definitely. Yeah. And um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, some of the Parsis here in the UK came from East Africa and from oh, Zanzibar. By that. Very interesting. Um, but, to be perfect, I'm not absolutely sure when they when they went there. I okay. think it's the same diasporic movement, probably yes. the same as say Hong Kong, but I'm not sure. For that, yeah, maybe later, because of course there are in Zanzibar there are all the Bajar, those that you see with all the Persian inscriptions so make sense that would be there. And uh, maybe I'll use this as a last question. My apologies to all the others whose lovely questions probably remain unanswered. The one final question, perhaps I'll leave the level of consultation communications between the clerical class, the, the priesthood in Iran and in India. Is there a dialogue? Is there back and forth discussing issues that come up? Is there a sort of a two-way traffic? Well, there's certainly, there's certainly communication and Iranian um, priests visit and go to the World Congress, for example, the Zoroastrian World Congress, um, and then there are, uh, do you mean the other way as well, going I to I think Iran. there was a question was, do they consult each other? And I presume and there was possibly the sense of 
which side might defer to whom? Oh, I <laughs> Is it a... No, well, I think, no, well, I think that's another very complicated question. I, yeah. I think it's true to say that Parsis still think of um, Iran as the homeland, the motherland, if, if you like. Yeah. And in Iran, um, again, in our interviews, it came up that they remember this, this time when the Parsis came to their help um, in the 19th century and um, got them out of this terrible situation mm. and um, improved their way of living and so on. So there's a great mutual, there's a huge connection and tie. Um, consulting each other on religious matters, probably not so much mm. these days because they've got very different things going on respectively. Mm. Yes, fantastic. Amazing, Sarah. I mean, I would have loved to have heard so much of the conversations you might have had to have to would to be a fly on the wall because I know that, you know, I want you to know how reticent they were when you asked about daily lives and marriage and inheritance and I don't know, you know, when someone passes away, it's an absolute fairyland, the journey to you know, ancient times to um, delve into these rituals, but that would have to be for another time. Could you please just name your books? I know we have it in the chat, the titles of your books. And uh, is it out? Like, I know it's out, but available. Could that yeah. could, um, uh, visitors get it? Um, so it's Voices from Zoroastra in Iran. Oral texts and testimony. I can't actually remember the title myself, <laughs> but it's um, voices from Zoroastrian in Iran. One is um, uh, the cities, Tehran, Shiraz, and so on. That's Tehran. right. Yes, absolutely. It's oral, latest, oral texts and testimony. Yeah, the yes, latest absolutely. one is Yazd in the villages, and it's Harasovitz yes. publishers. But it's, as I say, I'd love to do these recordings because um, you yeah. know not everyone will want to buy it. Mm, yeah. There's so much. I mean, people want to know, did you have feasts of food with them? What about food? What about paraphernalia of everyday life? And I think I know there is a bit in your book. So I think um, you've whetted the appetite of our visitors. And I um, urge everyone, you will find um, Sarah's details on the SARS website and do follow her adventures that there will be there is always um, new projects and of course some of you may have had the good fortune of visiting that amazing um, exhibition that was a size you know really spellbinding I think you know widely reviewed by the broadsheets and the tabloids and London, we don't often make it to the mainstream, you know, Sunday press review of an exhibition. The Eternal Frame Flame, am I saying that right? The everlasting Flame. Everlasting Flame. And which you then took to India, I think it was that India. time. Yes. yes, and we would love to now do it again, but so, an online version. So we'll have to. Of see. course, because everything, life is online now. So do please visit us again. Come back. A lot goes on. You will find more details about the Zoroastrian Institute online. And it's been an absolute pleasure hosting you. And I'm sorry that an hour goes by in a blink of an eye, uh, but I think it's been so fantastic that I think we'll persuade Sarah to come back. And next time I want more of her photographs. <laughs> and but no, yeah, thank you so much. Not thank at all. all. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you, Katie, and all the team and thank you to each and every one of you joining us from across the world whether it's from heat or sub-zero temperatures of um, different zones and we look forward to seeing you at various events 